I was, would have been quite happy to sit and listen to Mark talking about that text. It's, and it's been such a, a lovely experience to be sharing this time with you in God's presence, focusing on him and the things that he has done is the best thing, the best way to spend any time. Oh. I love it. My little girl, she, she's 11 now, but still she's, the life is so, so, so precious, isn't it? And the character and the personality bursting out, I love it. Now, I don't know about you, but when it comes to New Year's Eve, I really don't like New Year's Eve. It, it winds me up, all that hugging and kissing. It, it just, I don't like it. But what I, and also another element I don't like of it is, when I look back, I don't always like what I see, if I'm honest. When I look back, I don't always think, hmm, that didn't go so well. And when I look forward, I'm thinking, I, I, I make the mistake of looking at the future in the light of past failures. And it can be made worse, even if it's happened to you, but it can be made worse when you hear preachers come along or people in church talking about how they love God a billion times more today than they did this time last year. And now they've gone from glory to glory and now they're flying and they can float and they're glowing in the dark. And you're thinking, I can... And you think, I can barely get out of bed in the morning. W what am I doing wrong? I, can th I thank God for the graces and the mercies that I see in my life. I thank him for the way that he's fed me and provided for me. And we heard this earlier about the most important thing that God has done for us. Our salvation, the forgiveness of our sins, making us right before him so that the coming judgment is not something that we should fear. Somebody said to me once, my life would be fine if it wasn't for you in it. <laughs> they are nice. They said it was the worst thing in their life. In the back of my mind, well, theologically, that's not quite right. Because the worst thing in the life of someone is that dread of the judgment of God. But if you have Jesus, that is sorted. And so the text I want to look at talks about how if you're in that frame of mind and you're thinking that this year this year this been hasn't been that great yeah i've made some progress things are a bit better in this area of my life or that area but it's not that great not compared to this other person compared to this other person i'm an abject failure and so looking forward all i'm going to see is more frustration i've got a text i want to read from and it's on page 67 in your bibles in the um the church bible but it's exodus chapter 23 starting at verse 20 it's a part of god giving the law to moses and moses sharing the law with the people we we must never belittle god's law we're not saved by it but we must never belittle it because we know that jesus is the fulfillment of the law on our behalf we can't fulfill it We'll never be good enough by our own righteousness. Jesus has done it. But there is a third use of the law, and that is to guide the believer. How do I know the way forward? How do I know what to do? We come to hear and see what God has said, trusting in Jesus, our righteousness. So in this chapter 23, starting at verse 20, God has been giving his law, but now he's promising the children of Israel about how they're going to occupy the promised land that he's going to give them. And he says this, I am going to send an angel before you to protect you on the way and bring you to the place I have prepared. Be attentive to him and listen to him. Do not defy him because he will not forgive your acts of rebellion for my name is in him. But if you will carefully obey him and do everything I say, then I will be an enemy to your enemies and a foe to your foes. For my angel will go before you and bring you to the land of the Amorites, the Hethites, the Perizzites, the Canaanites, Hivites and Jebusites, and I will wipe them out. Do not bow and worship to their gods. Do not serve them. Do not imitate their practices. Instead, demolish them and smash their sacred pillars to pieces. Serve the Lord your God, and he will bless your bread and your water. I will remove illnesses from you. No woman will miscarry or be childless in your land. I will give you the full number of your days. 
I will cause you, the people ahead of you to feel terror and will throw into confusion all the nations you come to. I will make all your enemies turn their backs to you in retreat. I will send hornets in front of you and they will drive the Hivites, Canaanites and Hethites away from you. I will not drive them out ahead of you in a single year. Otherwise, the land will become desolate and wild animals would multiply against you. I will drive them out little by little ahead of you until you have become numerous and take possession of the land. I will set your borders from the Red Sea to the Mediterranean Sea and from the wilderness to the Euphrates River. For I will place the inhabitants of the land under your control and you will drive them out ahead of you. You must not make a covenant with them or their gods. They must not remain in your land or else they will make you sin against me. If you serve their gods, it will be a snare to you. The Lord bless the reading of his word. I am very conscious the most reliable part of any sermon is the reading of the scripture. All I can bring is words and so I could just pray that God will bring substance. Looking at these verses with a view to seeing the children of Israel entering and occupying the promised land as a type, as a picture. I do believe it happened. Okay? I'm, not, I'm not saying that it's just an allegory. It did happen. But there are things in the Old Testament that point to the New Testament, that point to our truth, the truth of, Je- of Jesus in us. And them going into the promised land is a picture of the life of Jesus reigning in us while we are here in earth, on earth. See some of that as living in heaven, that, that going into, into the promised land is heaven. Now, I, I, I'm, it's not a showstopper, and I don't think that anyone is evil if, they, if, we, if you disagree with me. But I see it as a type of living under Christ in this world. Because the children of Israel in that land were surrounded by enemies, facing temptation, facing death. And all these things are things we will not face when we, will, when we are in heaven. And so when we come to the end of a season, the end of a year, I mean, at the end of the day, (laughs) my daughter hates that phrase, at the end of the day, at the end of the year, it's just another clock tick, isn't it? As far as our watches are concerned, it's just a clock tick. God isn't limited by year, by our years, by our clocks. But in our hearts, in our minds, in our emotions, we do see this as significant. And the end of a season can be a time of frustration and regret, A new beginning can be a pressure to perform and hopes and expectations can be helps or hindrances in a new season of our lives. But there are things we need to know about our next step into the unknown. Because when I look at this, I want to emphasise our church is not called to impose political rule. We're here to proclaim the gospel. And what I see here as the Israelites' occupation of the land is our occupation of the land of our lives, taking control and living under the authority of King Jesus. It's interesting that very often, I'm not knocking Pentecostal churches, I've been raised in Pentecostal church and it's still in me in many ways. But there does seem to be this idea that we give control over. We just hand over control and we're not in control of our lives anymore. We just give God control. But if in this text we often saw what God is saying, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, I'm going to do the other. All what God is going to do and then, and you're going to do, and you're going to do, and you're going to do. It's under God's rule we have things to do. And remember that, the spirit, that we've been given the spirit of self-control. That's a funny thing. We've been told to control ourselves. Israel had, in the law, was already told how to bring a king in. Even though they didn't have a king, a good king until David, they were told, have, you will have a king, and that king will be under God. Self-governance under God. We're supposed to be in self-control under God, which is why we have the word. And so we've been given this, living under Christ's authority, and there are promises here which I think we have, which apply to us. And the first one that I see in this text is that we are not alone. The children of Israel had a mission to occupy the land. The nations that were already in the land were vast. They were huge armies. And we can see that because when the spies went in to check out the land, they came back saying, oh, we're not going to win this. Have you seen the size of them? 
It's, it's like Cwm Twrch Wanderers Rugby Club going up against New Zealand. It's not going to work. That's what some of the spies are saying, because they saw the giants, but others saw what God was telling them. And, but, so, but what that means is the enemy wasn't a small enemy. The mission to occupy this land was daunting. The odds were against them. And were it not for the presence of God with Israel, they would not have succeeded. You see, for we, we ha- when, when we're coming into this new year, there are problems that are going to seem so big. Problems from last year and the year before and the year before. They're going to seem too big. But God is saying, look, I'm with you. I'm, I'm not just figuratively with you, sort of I'm thinking about you and I hope everything goes well. He is literally with us. We were singing Christmas time about how Jesus is God with us. What I find interesting about that text when, G- when the angel is talking to Joseph, he says, you're going to call him Jesus to fulfill the prophecy that says he's going to be called Emmanuel. He says he's not called Emmanuel in the New Testament, but the truth of God being with us in Jesus is constant theme throughout the New Testament. When we're told that he tabernacled with us, that he's the image of the invisible God, he's the fullness of the Godhead bodily with us. The truth that God is with us in Jesus is a literal, actual, physical truth. So were it not for the presence of God with Israel, they would have failed. Yet they didn't fail. The first thing to note then is that they are not alone. The word angel can mean image or messenger. Either way, this angel is from God and for a purpose. Whatever God has given you, whether it's salvation, which is the most amazing thing anyone can give anyone because we certainly don't deserve it, whether it's that or whether he's blessed you with health, or whether he's blessed you with anything physically, with physical resources, whether he's ble- whatever he's blessed you with, your gifts, your talents, they're there for a reason. God gives for a purpose. And that purpose is his glory. It's, we're told that in, in, in Ephesians that the reason he saved us is that in the ages to come he can show the riches of his grace, the riches of his glories in Jesus. It's to show his glory. Look how awesome I am that I can save an idiot like Richard, pointing at me, like, like him. I can save someone like him. That's how great my grace is. That's how wonderful it is and how certain it is. So needless to say, God wouldn't be talking about this angel like this if it wasn't a big deal. If this angel doesn't guard them or bring them into the land, the angel has failed. And the second thing to note is that this land has already been prepared. It says that God has prepared the land. God isn't on the back foot wondering how he's going to achieve this. There's nothing, nothing that happens without God allowing it, without God having declared it from before the foundation of the world. So when lockdown struck, God wasn't there thinking, right, what am I going to do about this? I wasn't prepared for this. When, people, when these things happen, God is not caught unawares. So God's on the back foot. He prepared the land for them. You know, 2024 has been prepared for you. Whatever it brings, it's been prepared for you. As far as God is concerned, all that needs to be done has been done. And it's already been prepared. There's no need to fear that we have been left alone to fend for ourselves. When Jesus ascended to heaven, we weren't abandoned. His presence is with us and he works with us in our tasks. The tasks of facing the world can seem easy compared to the task of facing our own sin. The task of dealing with with, with someone else's sin is much easier than dealing with the task of my own sin. I'd, I'd much rather talk about your sin than mine because my sin, I can, I can barely budget sometimes. But your sin, oh, I can judge you about that. No, that's not how it's supposed to be. His presence in us and with us works in, inside us to transform us and make us more like him. Because if there's one word to describe how I'd apply this text to our lives, the word is sanctification. That is, we're not going to be perfect until we get to heaven, but we are going to be made more like Jesus as time goes by. According to God's will, we will be made more like him. And if we're not, then we want to get closer to him and pursue him harder. 
Because this way has been prepared and a destination has been prepared. It says in scripture, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So whatever the season ahead that God has in store, he is ready for it. And this angel has all authority and all victory. This angel must first be given attention. Don't miss what this angel is saying. Don't be too concerned with other things or you'll miss what this angel is saying. That's what the children of Israel are saying. Give him your attention. Don't be so obsessed with, with other things that you don't hear what he's told you. His voice matters. Not listening to him will mean destruction. This angel must not be rebelled against. God has previously tolerated to some measure rebellion among the people, but now he's giving the law, he's laying the groundwork, and he's saying, this angel, you must not rebel against him, because if you do, that won't be forgiven. Now, this is a difficult one to, to, to handle. Not forgiving. How can we deal with that? So the children of Israel, of Israel were told, if you disobey this angel, you go out of his scope, then you're not forgiven. How does that apply to us? Is, are, we in, are we at risk of not being forgiven for something we've done wrong? Very often there are Christians who walk with that sense of, God can't forgive me for this. God can't forgive me for that. 2023 might be the year where you did something and you just can't shake it. Or maybe you're going back even further and you've got that guilt still holding on to you. But this is the truth. God had, was giving them the law. He gave them the law to say, when you have sinned, you do these sacrifices, you do these things, and the blood of that animal will cover your sin. He made provision for the children of Israel for when they sinned. So what does this mean? It's because as long as they're under this angel's cover, they were safe. As long as they were in the cover of this angel, if they, were, if they rebelled against this angel, they were stepping out of God's law. They were stepping out of God's protection, stepping out of God's covenant. They were in a dangerous place when they were away from this angel. Some people say that this angel is Jesus, a literally Jesus, a Christophany. Others might say that it isn't Jesus, but possibly just a type or a picture of Jesus. But note that while the angel will guard them and lead them into the promised land, God also says that he will deliver them, wipe out their enemies in the land that he has prepared. Whoever he is, we can see enough similarities for application. So what does this apply to us? How does this apply to us? Because in Jesus, we have our security. In Jesus, we know that we are forgiven. In Jesus, we know that there is far more grace than there is sin. In Jesus, we know that though we are still battling with that flesh, even though there is still that battle going on where we do the things we don't want to do, we don't do the things we should do. We heard, I heard about in, the, in the prayer about that dear brother who thinks he's not witnessing enough. Bless him. I mean, who hand, hands up anyone who thinks they're witnessing enough? You know? But for all our weaknesses and failures and battles against the flesh, we are trusting in Jesus because we know that one day that battle will be over. We know that one day we won't have to worry about our sinful flesh, about that des those desires, those unhealthy, those sinful desires that still plague us. They'll be gone completely one day. Gone, and, and there'd be no need to question our own motives, let alone other people's. But uh, and until that happens, we have the covering of Christ who makes sure that our, his blood washes away our sins. We come back to him when we sin. We come back to him for forgiveness. We keep coming back to him, coming back to him, because we know that what he has done is enough. But for those outside of this angel, those outside of this Christ... They're the ones who need to fear, and that's why we need to give them the message, because they are in danger of God's judgment. The children of Israel were told, if you disobey this angel, you won't be forgiven. You will be condemned. That's the, that's the threat, because there won't be that cover. And outside of Christ, there's a whole world pending judgment. And that's a horrible, fearful thing. It's a terrifying thing. Which is why we want to tell people, come to Christ, be forgiven. Know that what Jesus did on the cross 
he died to forgive you for everything that you've done. The angel said to Joseph, you'll call him Jesus because he will save his people from their sin. For that reason, he's going to be called Jesus. Yeshua, Yahweh is salvation. What a wonderful thing we have in him. And all the victories in him. The inhabitants of the land are named. Now, when I went to... uh, I recently had to go to hospital for an angiogram and I didn't want to look at any videos beforehand about what it involved. It's not the most serious procedure in the world at all. And I'm very conscious, I'm in the presence of people who have had far more serious procedures. But I'm terrified of needles and I'm terrified of anything going into me other than through my mouth and preferably food. So I, I, I didn't want to be told the details and yet I was given some of the details oh they're going to do this and they're going to do that in the end it didn't hurt but I was afraid of the detail just naming the things that were going to happen and they're going to pump dye into your heart and what why would you do that that's that's terrible naming things can frighten us and yet God was naming to them all the people that were already in the land he was naming the, the Girgashites, the Hittites, and, and, and all the others. He was naming them. It's like, as I said, Cwm Turch Wanderers Rugby Club. And they're being told who they're playing in 2024. You're going to play New Zealand, South Africa, Australia, England. You're going to play those. That's not, that's not something to look forward to. And, may, and maybe you may be thinking about the things that you're going to face this year. And you don't want them named. You don't want them handled. And yet God names to them these things. Naming the inhabitants might not have been an immediate encouragement but because these are mighty people. But God doesn't say that the Israelites will blot them out, but that he will blot them out. Israel only has to obey. Now naming things can cause us to be spiritually crippled and they can hurt us. If we name things... That, are, that we know are in our lives that should not be in our lives. We curse them, we hate them, and we want them out. Just to name some of the things that affect our generation. Smoking, alcoholism, pornography, anger, materialism. If some of those pricked you, I'm sorry I didn't mean, I'm not here to hurt you. But those things can hurt. To know that they're there, they're in our hearts. These and things like these are giants for those who face them. But the battle is the Lord's. This doesn't mean that we sit back and do nothing. Neither does this mean that we rely on our own strength against insurmountable foes. The worst thing I think a preacher can say sometimes is go and try harder. Just try harder. You know you're not obeying the commandments, right? Just try harder. You've seen the list of the fruit of the Spirit? Just try harder. That's not the answer. Richard hasn't got the try harderness about him. I need Jesus. It's the fruit of the Spirit that's love, joy, peace, and all that. Not the fruit of Richard. The fruit of Richard is awful. That's, that's rotten. We want the fruit of God in us and flowing out of us. And this means that God has promised to deliver, and therefore he will. And in this, God warns them. You're not to be like those other people. You're not to worship their gods. You're not to do the things that they do. You're supposed to be distinct from them. You're supposed to be identified by who you worship and by how you live. I saw a video this week. I thought it was so exciting. This guy saw an ancient plaque in Egypt from 1500 BC. And on it is, is, is the oldest reference to the name Yahweh. And it was in reference to who the children of Israel are. And this was uh, one, of the, one of those things. You know, kings are always showing off who they've beaten. And in those days, because they didn't have the internet, they'd, put, they'd engrave it on stone. And this uh, Egyptian king had beaten Israel in a battle. And in the, in, in the hieroglyphs, it were, there were three words, land, nomads, Yahweh. So he was saying, I have, be- I have defeated the land of the nomads of Yahweh. The people, the wanderers of, of God, I've beaten them. That's what he's saying. These, that's how they were known. That's the way they're supposed to be known. They're the ones who worship Yahweh. We worship all these other gods, but then they worship him. Israel was to remove the things and, uh, of other gods that would distract them. And we're supposed to do that. The things that can get in the way. Access to material that harms us. 
access to things that can divert our attention. And I'm not talking always about the bad things that we shouldn't be watching, but things that can be harmless and yet they divert our attention. And when I was young, I was so much into Doctor Who, I just never had time for God because that's all I cared about was Doctor Who. That's all I read about, all I listened to, all I watched. That's what I was. The instruction is to not be like the world around us. Be hot or be cold. Remember that letter to the Laodiceans? Be refreshingly cold. Be a cold, an ice cold drink like you have in summer. A cold drink that's refreshing, like a Coca-Cola. There are other drinks that are better for you as well. But if it's ice cold and you can drink that and it's refreshing. Or be a hot drink, something that someone can drink when they need that, that reassuring warmth in, on a cold day. Be that hot drink, but don't be the same as your surroundings. Be different. Because it says in Thessalonians that this is the will of God for you. What is the will of God for you? It took for you to be happy? Is this the one that's the will of God? That you be happy on earth? No, that's eternal happiness to come. What is the will of God for you? Is it for you to be rich? Is that the will of God for you? Well, if it is, then many of us might be lacking something. Is it perfect health? If it is, then many of us should feel condemned for the illnesses that we have. The will of God for you is your sanctification. Sanctification means to be set apart, separate from the world. You belong to God. That's who owns you. God, not the world, not even you, but God. Note that it isn't that we don't interact with the world, it isn't that we don't go into the world, but that the world doesn't get into us. Now we come to a bit that can be contentious to, uh, to some people it shouldn't be, and, I'm wor and I worry at how often we can say that God has said things he hasn't. But it might have jumped out to you, these verses, where God says he's going to bless your bread and your water, and you're never going to be sick, and there'll be nobody miscarrying, and he will fulfil the number of your days. God promises the Israelites these blessings if they serve him. He promises to bless their lives in the land. He promises they will not starve or thirst. He promises to keep sickness from them. He promises them no problems in being fruitful with children. He promises their lives be full and long. In other words, he promises them a kingdom life, a life in the kingdom that he's establishing there, a life uh, uh, where life does what life is supposed to do from the start. He's promising the children of Israel right there a life that will do what life is supposed to do. Thrive, multiply and flourish. Now this is where we can see the prosperity gospel misapply this and cause people to lose faith in God's promises because they believe God said that he was definitely going to heal me and I'm still not healed. Or God promised definitely he was going to heal my grandmother and my grandmother's passed away. So either she's evil or God lied. They would say that you are being punished if you're financially poor, in poor health, unable to have children, die young or face disasters. Don't get me wrong, God can and does punish. That's not the scope of this sermon. Look at Ananias and Sapphira. That's an example. God does do these things. But that's not the emphasis here because it's not the everyday thing. God, we don't read in the book of Acts about how everyone who ever did anything wrong dropped dead. We are told about Ananias and Sapphira as specific examples about lying to the Holy Spirit. Here, what does this mean? Are we supposed to just lift this up and plonk it on our lives and say, right, God, where's my bank account? Where's all those pluses, all those zeros? Remember, they were given a kingdom to live in, the kingdom of Israel. But remember, the kingdom of which Jesus is king is not of this world. Remember when Pilate was talking to Jesus and said, don't you realise I could let you go? I could release you. What did Jesus say? Yeah, I'm going to call my angels now and they're going to wipe you out. There'll be, no, there'll be nothing left. No, he said, my kingdom isn't of this world. If my kingdom was of this world, it would behave as though it was of this world and my servants would come and wipe you all out. But it's not of this world. Remember that under King Jesus, we are rich beyond all measure. You, if, if you are under King Jesus, if you know Jesus, you have something that no money can buy. I'm not saying it's wrong to have money. If you've got money, God bless you. It's not wrong to have money. The Bible doesn't say it's wrong to have money. But salvation, this rich, the wealth that we have in Jesus, is worth more 
then anything you can have in your bank balance, anything you can have in your portfolio, anything that you can have in your possessions, in your stock, in whatever it is. What you have in Jesus is eternal life, eternal justification, eternal acceptance, eternally being known as a child of God. And that's just scratching the surface. What Jesus has done for you, no money can buy. And in him, we are rich beyond all measure. We are incorruptible in Jesus. Yes, we are fighting the flesh. But do you know that eternal life has started for us? If you're a Christian, your eternal life has started. At the moment, we're hindered by our old fleshly nature. It's with its temptations, everything battling us. But the truth is... <clears throat> We are incorruptible spiritually. What about fruitfulness? The fruit of the Spirit. We have been called to be fruitful, just like the children of Israel were called there to be fruitful. We are to be fruitful with the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, patience, kindness. All that, if that's coming out of your life, that is more fruitful in terms of God than anything else. And we're immortal. The children of Israel, the, the, the people who are there hearing that and going into the promised land they would one day die physically die but the person that you've become as a part of God's kingdom lives forever Jesus said I am the resurrection and the life whoever believes in me though he die yet shall he live and God has made the provision He's put the enemies to run from them. The enemies that would have frightened Israel were actually frightened by Israel because of what God had done. He was chasing them out. They were chasing away their enemies. And we look at our lives and the things that are struggling with, they're struggling with. I think it's just too much. I'm always making the same mistake. I'm always drawing them from the same bad water and I wish I could just do the right thing. Do you know, you're not alone. You're really not alone in that struggle. The danger you've got is if you haven't got that struggle. The danger is if you're sitting back and I've got no battle with the flesh. I'm, 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 it's all done. This is what Paul said. So I find a new a law. Sorry, I'll start again. In Romans chapter 7. So I find it to be a law that when I do... When I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being... But I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? I do the things I don't want to do that I know I shouldn't do, and I do, don't do the things I know I should do. What is the answer for us? Is it that we just accept that we are forever under the power of sin? But no, because the promise that Paul has goes on to say, there is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We sang about amazing grace. This is the amazing grace. There's no condemnation. God's not there with a long list of things you've done wrong and he's, and he's looking for an excuse to give you a cold or give you a flu or, or make you trip up and break a leg. That's how people often see God. He's there with a bolt of lightning just waiting to hit you. But no, God wants to bless us and he's forgiven us in Jesus. There's no condemnation. The people in your street, your, your spouse, your relatives are going more against you than God and God knows you better. Because you've been forgiven in Jesus. He's made that provision. But did you notice this at verse 29? I will not drive them out for you in one year, lest the land become desolate. Little by little, I will drive them out before you. And you may be thinking, looking back at the last year, I should have made more progress. I really should have made more progress. God has been faithful, but I haven't. I should have made more progress. Progress is coming. And it may well be that you've been trying to target an area of your life that you know is, needs to be dealt with. And God's saying, no, no, I don't want to deal with that one just yet. This is the one I want to deal with. We'll deal with that in 2024. I want to deal with this in 2023. And you might think, well, that's a nothing thing. What God wants to deal with in 2023, that's not as big as this thing. Surely you should have sorted that. I've been saved for 50, 60, 70 years. That hasn't been sorted yet. God, what's going on? I'm such a failure. And God is saying, you think you're a failure. But it's because I haven't brought that to attention yet. I don't want that dealt with yet. I will deal with that 
It's not good, it is sin, but I will deal with that when I am ready. When the, when the children of Israel were fighting Hittites, they weren't supposed to be fighting the Jebusites. God is saying, right, you're fighting these people now. What about those over there? We'll deal with those again. We're fighting these people now. And then we'll go to these people over here. Their occupation then was little by little. This means there might have been times when they thought they were going too slow. This also means there were times when they might have thought they were going too quickly. Whoa, whoa, hang on, God. This is, this is going too quick for us. I was trying to keep up. But the victory would be theirs. And God's work of sanctification means that as we grow, we mature. We will not fully mature overnight or in one day. As long as your eyes are fixed on Jesus... You don't have to be jealous of someone else who seems to have overcome a sin that you're still battling with. Because your trust is still on Jesus and he will deal with it. I know someone who's good, I've been good friends with a long time and he battled with smoking. Now, I'm not here to condemn you if you smoke. I'm, I'm not here to say that you're going to hell or anything like that, okay? My friend was battling with, with smoking. He thought and he felt in his heart it was wrong. It was the wrong thing for him to do. But he couldn't give up. But one day he woke up and he felt God saying to him, you're not going to smoke anymore now. And under God's strength, he stopped. He's never looked back. And I find that amazing. And, that, and that's the work that God does. We work in the, in the way that he works. Like Doctor Who with me. To you, you might think, oh, watching that, that's no harm in that. That's a small thing. But in my life, there was a massive thing. It's embarrassingly massive thing. A TV programme should never have that place in anyone's life, no matter how young they are. But God had to deal with that. Well, for someone else, he was dealing with something else. We might think that we know which areas of our lives need to be sorted first. And this can lead to frustration when we're not seeing growth where we think it should be. God, you should be fixing this part of my life now. This is where I'm weak. This is where things are wrong. And God is saying, yes, you are right. You are weak there. And it is wrong, but this is what I'm working on right now. The battle, the victory, the occupation of our lives, of our hearts to come under his rule belongs to God. And for this reason, we might do well to not judge others for the sin that we can see in their lives. We can help them, counsel people, even bring their attention to it in case they don't know about it. But we need to be careful. If I'm going to if I'm going to grumble against someone because they, all they ever talk about is EastEnders, they watch EastEnders. Oh, can you believe how they just always watch EastEnders? They're watching reruns. They, oh, they, all they do is watch EastEnders. Oh, that's awful. And I might need that little finger to point at me and say, hey, remember you? <coughs> Doctor Who? Yeah. Which is more believable. <laughs> it may be that what besets another is something that God has granted to us at an earlier stage. Well, something that besets us has been granted to someone else before us. But there is something very important to come in the last two verses, and we're finishing now. They were told, you do not make a covenant with these people. Do not make a deal with them. Do not set up a system where you can live with it. Now again, I am not saying at all that we should be going around smashing up buildings of other religions. That's not what I'm saying here. That was the instruction to the children of Israel occupying that land that God was giving to them, and I believe that God has given to them. For us, these are the things that we can make deals with in our lives. And we can say things like, I know I've got a bad temper, but no, that's just me. That's me making a deal with sin. That's me making my sinful nature acceptable, and you have to put up with it when you see my temper. I know that, you know, looking at a bit of porn, that's all right, it's okay, don't worry about it. Whereas Jesus has said that if you look at a woman with lust, then you've already committed adultery. If you're, if you're actively hating a group of people, for whatever reason, oh, I hate them, but that's just me. That's just what I am, you know. That's, that's... Don't make a deal with these people, God said to the children of Israel. Don't make a covenant with them. Don't let them in. Don't let them stay. Don't let their values infiltrate you because you will try and mix their values with your values and it won't mix. Look at the golden calf. 
The golden calf, this is the frightening thing about the golden calf. The golden calf was not a replacement for Yahweh. The children of Israel never brought in that golden calf to replace God. They said that God and the golden calf brought them out of Egypt. They brought the golden calf alongside God. And so often we can bring things alongside God into our lives. This is what my life is about. My life is about this, my job. My life is about getting this money. My life is about getting that thing or overcoming that person or whatever. We bring that in alongside God. The world looks so interesting because it is. There's a lot going on in the world that is so compelling. And it would urge us to make a peace treaty with it and abandon what God has said in his law just so that we can bring it in alongside but we must not be tricked. In Joshua chapter 9, the Gibeonites tricked Joshua into making a covenant with them. Because they were nearby and they thought Joshua's going to come and wipe us out as they're occupying this land, what can we do? Let's make some bread. And they made some bread and they let it stay for a while until it started to go off. And then they carried the bread and went to Joshua and said, we want to make a covenant with you, please. Look, you can tell by your bread, it is fresh when we left and now it's gone off. We've travelled that far. We travelled all the way from over there. Will you make a covenant with us? And Joshua looked at the bread and thought, yeah, okay. One of the few instances where he didn't inquire of the Lord. And he just said, yeah, okay, that is pretty obvious. My eye is telling me that. Yeah, you're fine. He made a covenant with them and it was a problem for them. We are never to make peace with sin. Sin is never okay. Now, I'm conscious that what I said earlier can be taken to mean it is. That we battle one sin and we're not battling the other at the same time. That doesn't mean the other sin is okay. We don't make peace with it. Sin is never okay. Because some sin is hard to deal with, it is being proclaimed as okay. Not a sin and even to be good. But beware, we do not make peace with sin. That's why God's law is important. So that we know the right from wrong. As I said, we're not saved by keeping it because we can't. But to find out the way that we should go, we come to God's word. For though besetting sin has not yet been dealt with, though you want it gone, resist the temptation to justify it or become friends with it. It's just an enemy that hasn't been dealt with yet. We need to trust God and follow his instruction that he will deal with us as and when and how he wishes. And in the meantime, that things go wrong, we'll keep res- we need to keep resisting the, the enemy. In the meantime, as things go wrong, we keep resisting the enemy and trusting that God will give us the victory that he has promised. We might not see the victory today. We might not have seen the victory in 2023. I pray that we see the victory that we're looking for, each one of you and myself, in 2024. But don't beat yourselves up if, as you've been seeking God, following him, desiring his will, and there's something still not yet done. It might be 2025 might be 2026. It might be in that transition to our new bodies. That might be when it might happen. But what we do know is that we do have an eternity of this health, wealth, glory and wonder. But on earth, we are battling. We have to keep battling and don't be discouraged. Don't let the problems or the discouragements of this last year hinder you. Remember the good things that have happened in this past year to know that God can do things and trust him for the battles that are coming and will be won in 2024. Happy New Year to you all and God bless you all. May you know his presence with you because his presence will be with you. Amen.